we can be free, yeah, yeah, I know that Let's try to fix the things that's been broken We can be free, yeah, Good yeah, I know morning. that Good morning. Good morning. There we go. I tell you what, it's exciting to get together, to come and to worship God. And when we come in, I hope that if you're a regular tender here at Hope Christian, you make it a goal to encourage someone when you come in the doors. I just come in like, can I find the best seat? I want to find where I need to sit. And it's cold in here. It's hot in here. No, how can I encourage someone? But there are times that you know, we need encouragement ourselves. But when we come together, it is great to encourage one another. My name is Dave, and it's just great to have you here today. And if you watch and listen online, I want to welcome you. Look forward to meeting you someday. It amazes me sometimes people come at our doors and say, yeah, I've been listening to you online before we came. And I said, and you still came. That's, that's amazing. It's amazing. But we're thankful that is an outreach tool uh, to reach out to the community to share the love of Jesus. And uh, as I said, you know, when, when you think about encouragement, sometimes you need encouragement because the Bible says that the rain, uh, God gives sunlight on the evil and the just, and he sends rain on the evil and, and, the, and the good alike. And so sometimes bad things happen to us. But the great thing is that when those things are happening, God is still there. God is still there with us. And so let's give a hand clap of praise to our God this morning. He's awesome God. We need to praise Him even in bad times. Um, I think on our sign I saw something about when you worry, you praise. When you worry, you worship the problem. When you worry, you worship the problem. I thought, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty powerful. You know, our thinking, what it does. You know, uh, we just saw a video right before I came out, and, and maybe that was kind of like your ride to church. Hopefully not that extreme, but it can happen. Because somebody said families are like fudge, mostly sweet with a few nuts. And that's, yeah, y'all are thinking about right now. And Tony's thinking, unless it's the Crawford family, then it's quite a, quite a few nuts. But anyway, we are on this sermon series entitled Me to We. Me to we. Last week we saw that it takes at least two to have a relationship. And that we both, or both parties need to work to have a relationship. We also saw last week that God desires, this awesome God of all creation, desires a relationship with us. And so we need to do our part to make that relationship grow. And so today, moving from me to we, we want to say me to we, we relationships matter to the family. Relationships matter to the family. Family relationships can be difficult. I will tell you, you have a bulletin and you see one scripture in the bulletin, you're going to see another one up here. It's because I changed it uh, quick on Tony. So it's not her fault. It's not the office's fault. I did that. And so you can say, Dave, why'd you change that? But you know, family relationships can be difficult at some times. They can be. Um, and so if you think your problems are bad, uh, consider the marriage mayhem created when 76-year-old Bill Baker of London recently wed Edna Harvey. She happened to be his, excuse me, she happened to be his granddaughter's husband's mother. And so that's where the confusion began, according to Baker's granddaughter, Lynn. Lynn said, My mother-in-law is now my step-grandmother. And my grandfather is now my step grandfather, excuse me, my stepfather-in-law. My, mo my mom is my sister-in-law, and my brother is my nephew. But even crazier is that I'm now married to my uncle, and my own children are my cousins. Yeah, and they work for West Virginia either. If y'all got any smart marks, all right? But anyway, it, it gets crazy. But you know, sometimes we think of old television shows, family TV shows. What, what's some titles of some of those TV shows? From old TV shows. Father knows best. Father knows best. Well, that's Dick a woman that said that one. What was that? Dick the Dick Van Dyke Show. My Three Sons. My Three Sons. Leave It to Beaver. Little House of Prairie. Every the Apple Tree was a family. <laughs> um, what was another one? The Waltons. The Brady Bunch. The Brady Bunch. I almost called this series The Brady Bunch. I'm like... That's just too corny. If I think it's corny, it's too corny. I can't do that. But, um, yeah, and then, of course, you've got the family feud, which you uh, really see some nuts in there. But families, you know, we, we all have our issues. We all have our difficulties in, in families. I, I just got to tell this. I'm sorry, Tony. But 
Paul Crawford told me, if you know the Crawfords, he said, you know, they can make a movie of when the Crawfords go to heaven. The Crawfords meet Jesus. And Tony says, Paul, don't get up there and embarrass me in front of Jesus. Don't be telling any of those crazy stories about your family. So that was just a little input there. But families, these relationships can be difficult. And so before we begin the message, let's go and ask God's direction in our message today. Father, you are amazing. You're an awesome God, creator of this universe. And God, I just, I'm in awe of you. And I thank you that you loved us enough that you want a relationship with us. And God, you know, I confess, even while doing this message, I looked and said, oh man, I have a little ways to go. And it's tough. And so Holy Spirit, I ask you to speak today and help us all to, to work more in our relationships within our families. I just ask that you speak. And God, you know, I pray that uh, you speak to us today and we have open hearts to hear what you have to say to us so that we will have the relationships within our families that you have a desire for us to have. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the privileges we have in this country that I think we, I take for granted is we have copies of the Bible. And, uh, you know, like I said, I know many of us take it for granted. I don't know how many copies I have, even within this tablet right here with the different translations, how many I have. And so since we have these so readily available to us, you know, we ought to take advantage of that and, and read the scriptures because this is God's lifeline to us. Uh, as some of the, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record about the, the life of Jesus and the epistles that are written to help us live godly lives. And then the old covenant, which we learn from their example. We do not follow the old, we're not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant, but we can learn from their example. So I just challenge you, take advantage of that. And if you have your Bible with you today, uh, we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, going through a little bit of chapter, uh, chapter 6. And if you do not have your Bible, most of the scriptures will be on the screen. Now the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And he's teaching the believers how they should live. He really gets into this in about oh, chapter 4 and going on through 5 and 6. So we're going to start in Ephesians 5, 21. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Ephesians 5, 21. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing, uh, cleansing of God's word. He did this to present him, excuse me, her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an, it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is, uh, this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well with you, and you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, as we start at looking at this scripture, I just want to start out by saying that we want to start with this important point. I started in verse 21, and I believe that 21 ties the following verses uh, in, into the prior verses, the verses before that. And so I'm just going to sort of look at those verses from verse 18. Paul says this, don't be drunk on wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, what's that look like? Singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for who? Christ. Christ. We are all to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so everything we look at this morning in reference to the family, the responsibility of the husband, the responsibility of the wife, 
the children, is living submissively in reverence for Christ. The family is important to our society and even more important to our spiritual lives. So, in, you know, in the family, relationships matter to the wife. Say wife. Wife. You still have to sleep. Say wife. <laughs> there you go. Now we're awake. So that way the person next to you is going like, wife, what? You know. So, I remember hating myself. The wife said, all right. So, I kind of went a little bit out of order. I did that on purpose to help better understand this relationship. Look back at verse 25. For husbands... This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washing by the, uh, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or, any, or other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. Paul tells us that man shows submission to Christ by loving his wife as much as he loves himself. Uh, being true and faithful to her. And, and so we need to submit to Christ as men and be faithful to our wives and loving our wives. They, um, having a sacrificial love for her even when the relationship is tough. Because life, is, let me tell you, something is going to happen in every relationship. And difficult issues will arise. And men, what he's saying is that we are living in submission of Christ. And just because things aren't easy right now, maybe her health is bad. Maybe things are, are, are taxing upon her and it's causing relationship problems. You are to love your wife, is what he is saying. Basically, Paul is saying, husbands, you treat your wife with love and respect, sacrificing for her, just as Christ has done for the church. And as I said, man, I preached this sermon. I'm studying it like, oh, man, God, sometimes it's really tough to be your messenger. Because I confess, I need to work on this more and more. I've been more and married for 36 years. And still, I need to be reminded, love your wife. Treat her when things aren't that good. You still love your wife with all your heart. You do sacrificial love living that way. Basically, Paul is saying, husbands, you treat your wife with love and respect and sacrifice for her. In the family structure, relationships matter to the wife. And relationships matter to the husband. Say husband. husband. All right, starting back in verse 22. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Now, all of us within a family structure have responsibilities. The verse can seem very harsh. It can seem very harsh sometimes. However, if a husband is carrying out his responsibility, the, the abilities, the way the Lord intended, then the wife's responsibility is not difficult at all. The problem comes when one part of the family structure does not follow the true design. And we'll go into detail on that a little bit further on, a little bit later on here in a few moments. And so, in the family structure, relationships matter to the husband, and relationships matter to the, matter to the wife, and relationships matter to the children. Let's say together, children. Children. Verse 6, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Once again, we see submissiveness to Christ in the way we handle our children. The way we handle them, we're, we're to submit to Christ, not allowing anger to take over as fathers, but, but to, to handle our children in the correct way. Now this verse mentions fathers, and maybe you mothers are thinking, oh God, it didn't mention me, and my children have been so bad lately, I can provoke them all I want. But now we'll talk a little bit more about that too. <laughs> And sometimes the difficulty we have in Scripture is that we do not have the Apostle Paul here to say, hey, hey, hang on a minute. What if, how, how does this apply if, if that happens? You know, so it, it, we can easily misunderstand. We can misunderstand what he, he is saying. If we look back, you know, Paul writes that wives should be submissive in everything. 
Hmm, really? I mean, what if the husband tells a wife to, to break a law or to commit a sin? You see, Paul is writing in a broad statement here. What he is writing is, as he sees how this structure should work. This is how the structure should work. Husbands, you love your wives. You, you, you love them as Christ loved the church. Wives, you, you submit to your husband. You respect your husband. And, and children, you know, you, you fathers, you, you uh, make sure you handle them in the right way. This is the picture he wants. Um, in the same way here, Paul's addressing the father, yet he certainly does not mean it's okay for the mother to provoke her child. But actually, Paul, writing, assuming that everyone is following the structure he has just told us about. And we're going to talk about this, just like I said, just like the others, a little bit more. Fathers have a great responsibility at, at, in, a, in submitting to God to be the leader he has called us to be. You're like, submission, leader, what? Yeah. Us men need to submit to Christ and do what Christ tells us to do. Paul is stressing the responsibility here by telling the father to lead a child. Don't drive them. You know, as men, sometimes it's in our makeup that we will drive. And I see it more that I will do that more. I would do that more with my son and my two daughters. I would have a, a tendency to expect more out of him, maybe, or, uh, as a young man than I would my daughters. You know, handle it different. I, and it's one of the things I have to work on. Don't sit there and drive them, because usually you drive them away, but you lead them in the ways of God. And notice, children, that there's also responsibility here for you. You're like, oh, dude, I hope Dave would just skip that part. Here it goes. Verses 1 through 3, chapter 6. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well with you and you will have a long life on earth. Relationships are important to families. They're very important to families. And when the families fall apart, many people, and I mean many people, are hurt. Some people are hurt for generations because the family is messed up. And since families are that important to Christ, when it comes to our families, when it comes to them, certainly we must put in the effort. Put in the effort to our families. Let's say put in the effort. Put in the effort. That's what we need to do. Put in the effort to make our families what God wants them to be. It is said, the family is the first essential cell of human society. The family is the first essential cell of human society. And, and I believe that is true. When we look at our society and the mess that our society is in, what's that tell us about our families? They're messed up. We're messed up. Our families are messed up. And, uh, you know, that responsibility falls upon us as the church, upon you, upon me. When we look at our school systems and those who work in the school systems, volunteer in the school systems, we see children who are not being taught at home the, brace, the basic principles of right and wrong according to God's word. And many times we can always go, oh, that school system. That school system. Oh, that stinking school system. But I want to tell you, I know what I was told whenever I went to school, and probably many of y'all heard of this thing, the same thing. You get in trouble at home, you're going to get, I mean, school, you're going to get in trouble when you get home. I'm like, Oh, man. Even like that today. What did that teacher do to you? What did that? We're going to go in there and read it. It's going to have it out with that teacher. And man, I mean, I was told you will respect. You will respect as a child. And you will respect. I still remember this is before many vans. Uh, you know, the big old Mercury's or whatever. There's five of us kids. And we're riding in the back seat. We'd be talking. And if we ever referred to one of our teachers by their last name only, for some reason, dad's and mom's ears were always perked. Who? Who? Oh, Mr. or Mrs. You know, I have trouble today. Uh, my basketball coach, who I go out to eat with sometimes, Tammy and I go out to eat, I cannot call him by his first name. It's Mr. Sharp or Coach Sharp. I can't do it. I can't. It won't come out. I'm so grounded in the fact that you pay respect to those who taught you. It's Mr. and Mrs. Even though we, we'll, we'll go out to eat, we talk together, uh, it's Mr. Sharp to me. You know, so and that's just the way it is. And, and so... We need to realize that the school system, sometimes we blame it, but it all comes back to the home life. You know, we see children who aren't getting the proper love and care for their homes. And uh, if you can even call them homes, 
When I'm preaching, sometimes I, I feed all people who are, are animated. In the first service, Caitlin Flanagan's been coming. And I, and I, told, uh, I told Victoria back there, the first service, she was motioning to something I was saying. I was like, see, I call you out on you. Because it excites me to see they're listening and they're, they're getting into it. And so I comment on Caitlin has just started teaching in the school system. And I'm talking about these kids who sometimes you, your heart goes out to them. You know they're not getting the love at home. And then some of them you just want to wring their necks because they're so misbehaving. Because, see, I can see school teachers. I see Robin back there right now going, yeah, but you know, you know down inside the reason they're acting out is because they don't have anything at home. They don't have they taught anything at home. They're not loved at home. How do they even call it a home? And sometimes I look at some of these kids, if I'm volunteering in the school system or wherever, and I think, how do you survive? How in the world do you, my heart breaks for you, how do you survive? I can't understand how some of these children survive today. But we see children who aren't getting that proper love. We see children who are being raised, if you can call it that, by parents who are substance abusers. And so what do you expect the children to become? It is sad. It is sad when you see that. We see parents who, in a fluent family sometimes, I and mean, when they look like everything's good, but parents are too busy, busy, busy to take time with their children. And their children are being taught values by the social media. And so our families are falling apart. Children grow up believing their messed up lives are normal. That's that just like, just wow. I mean, you, you don't believe that? You go up to the jail on visitation day. And you sit in there and you watch families come in. And children, this is like normal to them. We're going to visit daddy in jail today. I'm like, ah. You know, that's just, you know, and back there sits a, a, a magistrate, and he'll tell you the same thing, that it blows my mind that, that, we, that these poor children don't know any better. I remember doing teen camp, and we were on a bus early in the morning, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to catch a nap, because it gets very tiring doing teen camp when I was a youth minister. And so I'm there, and I got my eyes closed, and this one kid who, somebody gave him the name Beanhead. It was funny. He was an adult. He was out here working one day. He's like, hey, you remember me? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Do you remember what they used to call me? I'm like, he's proud of that name. I said, yeah, Beanhead. Yeah, that's it. But the poor guy, he was young. He was sixth grade this time. And so I, I got my eyes closed. Hey, Dave, you asleep? I'm like, uh, well, I was trying. <laughs> so he started this. So I started asking him about his family. He's telling me. And then he says, yeah, and mom has a baby. But right now they're getting ready to have the baby tested to see if dad is the father. And I'm sitting there going, like, he's like talking, this is just normal. He's a sixth grader. He's like, this is like normal life. This is terrible. This is what he's growing up with. This is his influence in life. And that's sad. Children don't know there is a better, better life out there. And I know, I know, I was raised in a family, mom, dad, five of us kids, perfect, no, 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 no. But believing in God, having mom and dad I knew loved me, I knew were there to provide for me, gave me security, it blows my mind, and they're out there everywhere. But that's why, because I relate to my background as others relate to theirs, and I think how sad it is, how sad that these children don't have that security, don't have that teaching. And I'll tell you right now, the government cannot fix the problem. Boom. All right? The government cannot fix it. And I'm not against government trying to help some because I, my heart goes out to people who, who are addicted. And you say, well, they're the ones that did it. And, and, yeah, but, you know, everybody needs an idea. And that stuff's tough. It's tough to get off of. And so my heart is going, man, we got to catch these kids before they get to that stuff. we got to get them early in life. We need to show them love. We need to teach them what's right from wrong. We need to make sure they're protected. You know, I think about my grandkids, and I'm in that jail visiting someone. I'm thinking, I don't want to see my grandchildren in jail. Don't ever want to. And so I take opportunities to share with them the things of Jesus. Only Jesus can fix this situation. And guess what, church? We are to be Jesus to the world. Wow. So how are we doing right now with our families? Church, how are we doing? And how are we doing in ministering to other families? You know, I, I believe with all my heart, I believe with all my heart that, that we as Christians fall short and don't realize 
the power of a good example. And when I say that, what I'm saying is this, that, you know, when we're living a life as a Christian family and we're hanging around with a world who's not, you don't have to preach at people a lot of times. You just live it in front of people and they want to know what you got. And you let them know what you've got is Jesus. You're like them. You have struggles. The only thing difference is you have Jesus who is helping you. And isn't it nice when you sit there and bump your tablet and it goes right off your notes into your index. So I'm going to read back to it. So excuse me for that. But as we think about what God has done for us, certainly our family structure, we need to be working hard. And to make sure that we're doing what God has designed for us to do. Church, we need to start right here with our families, our individual families. Not look at other families and say, if that was my kid, I hope you never said that. For some reason, God didn't let me say that. And I'm like, don't ever say that, Dave, because you never know what your kid will be like or your grandkid. If that was my kid, I'd... <laughs> don't, don't go there. You really don't know. And so, God says this about families, okay? I hate divorce. I hate Divorce. Notice he did not say, I hate the divorced people. I'm afraid sometimes the world confuses that and says, I can never come to God have been divorced. I would say, my God can forgive any situation. Sometimes it's not even that person's fault. Um, but uh, I'm going to read a scripture. And although it's under the old covenant, it still it can apply today how God feels uh, about divorce in Malachi 2, 14 to 16. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young. But you have been unfaithful to her. Though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. God says, I hate divorce because it hurts people. And I love people. That's what he's saying. So do not let Satan riddle you with guilt if in your past you've had a divorce. Start with the relationship you have today and make sure that you're working to the best of your ability to make that relationship work. You know, like I said, God hates divorce because it causes hurts. For generations, it causes hurts. I remember talking to a grown man. He one time talked about when his parents divorced, how it hurt him. And even as a grown man, he had cried because of what had happened. And so God knows. And God says, I, I hate it. I, I don't like people being hurt. I don't want people being hurt. You know, we uh, need to look at our relationships and say, what can we do to make them work? How can I go from me to we? Jack and Judith Balswick in their book, the family, a Christian perspective on the contemporary home, wrote this. The logical beginning point of any family relationship is a covenant commitment, which has unconditional love at its core, out of the security provided by the covenant love uh, develops grace. Now this is true. It's true. You know, you start out with a covenant relationship, and it's wonderful that it takes work. You know, some of y'all in here, maybe you're newlyweds, and you're like, oh no, oh no, everything is great, everything is wonderful, and I'm in love. Let me tell you, I've been married 36 years. Yeah, and sometimes some days aren't great. You're like, aren't you glad Tammy's working this morning, day? You know, but she'll tell you the same thing. Some days, you, that person you were so in love with, you wake up in the morning and go like, what the world did I do? Why did I marry this person? You know, Oh, I'm glad you're sitting on that end of the chairs and your wife is on this end because she has given you some looks. <laughs> but that's the way relationships work. You know, we, we, we do have our differences. But here's, here's the secret. When Paul, I mean Paul, when Satan, sorry Paul, starts, <laughs> I'll tell you about it, but when Satan whispers in your ear all the negative things about your spouse and you listen to them, you're in trouble. Okay, you're in trouble. Think of those things which are good, which are, which are pure, which are lovely, which, which are praiseworthy, admirable. Don't sit there and dwell on the negative things about your spouse. We all got negative stuff. 
But when you dwell on it, here that part comes of being submissive again. See, that covenant relationship, I promise before God, I'm going to do my best. Now, sometimes that other mate will not work that way. And sometimes you're left. You're just left because they're not going to make the effort. And so, remember we said the family relationships call for us to live submissively. What does submit mean? Well, it means to yield or surrender oneself to the will or authority of another. You know, a thought to remember is that you can only submit when you're in a place of some amount of power. What's that mean? God gave you a free will. We talked about this last week. God gave you a free will. You are in a position to submit. It calls for all of us in relationships to submit. And as I said, this, this teaching is, a, is a difficult for, for many in our culture in which we live. Submissive, submissiveness is seen as weakness. Yet it is not weakness. Trust me, when you're strong enough to submit, wow, that, that, that takes some strength. But it's a choice that we make. And so that the structure can function the way God has designed it to, especially the case of the family structure. When we read that a wife is to submit to her husband, it does not mean that she is less than her husband. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, she may be more efficient, she may be more intelligent than her husband. This is just the order that God has set up. It's just God's design. Being submissive does not mean that the woman is to be a lap dog either. It means that she is there to help her family and, and her spouse uh, her husband to be the leader that God has called him to be. Because sometimes that man needs some help to be the leader that God has called him to be. She doesn't follow the man around blindly allowing abuse. The godly woman knows what's right and what's wrong. Now, I have seen some men who treat women terribly, and I mean terribly. And, uh, you know, they, they, they love to use that scripture, you know, wives submit to your husband. Just like the, the, the video we watched, the uh, wives submit to your husband. You're down to watch the kids. That's wrong. I used to tease Tammy all the time with this old song. Put another log on the fire, cook me up another pot of beans, go out and jack up the car and change the tire, mend my socks and some old blue jeans, come on baby. I was teasing, definitely. Uh, it, it, it could get me in big trouble. But you know, men, we are not to treat our wives that way. They are not lesser beings. One of the problems was in the feminist movement is they said, we are equal and we are the same. I don't know what world you live in. But men and women are not the same, okay? I ain't talking physically. I'm talking even emotionally and everything else. We are wired totally different. If you ain't figured that one out yet, I don't know what planet you've been living on. We, we think differently about things. We react differently to things. We're different. We are equal, but we are different. If they had done say, hey, we're, we're different, but we're equal. Yes, we are. We have different responsibilities in God's design. Again, it comes back to man being submissive enough to God and accepting the responsibility that God has given us as men. Men, we are to love our wives as Christ loved his church. Think about that. Wow. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. Is Christ trying to harm the church at all? Is he trying to be cruel to the church at all? No. Like I said, somebody told me today, one of the guys said, Man, I'd like to see some of the conversations in the cars going home today between the husbands and the wives. It's like, I'm glad I bought, I bought a different car this morning. I'm icing my toes. And I'm saying, hey, I'm in the same boat with you, buddy. We can, we can forget a lot of this stuff. Uh, we should sacrifice for our wives, man. We should sacrifice. Not, not be selfish saying, I want the new car. I want the new gun. I want this. I want that. How about working together and say, what can we do together? We need to protect her. Show her that she is loved. And again, this is not an insult to women. It's not saying, you just are not as intelligent. You're not as strong as we are. Uh, no, it's not saying that. It's saying this is God's plan. And we are wired differently. And we need to be thankful for the way we have been wired. But live submissively to God and do our own roles. God has designed us to work together. And some relationships look differently than others because of our personalities. They're a little bit different. However, we should never work outside of God's, in God's design. You know, we men need to be submissive to God and stand up and do the job that God has given us. And ladies, the same way, being submissive to God, allowing the men and even supporting the men to be the godly man that he's supposed to be. You know, my wife, when I entered the ministry, 
One on one, I'm more of an introvert. And in one instance, I remember specifically, she said, Dave, when you go up to the bank, because I also had a youth account, and I was in the youth ministry, and she said, when you go up to the bank, you need to talk to those tellers. They asked me what you were angry about. And, and so my wife helps me in that way. Is she not being submissive? I tell, no, 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 she is my helpmate. She is helping me. And, and so now I, I make that a, a, a practice of mine. And, and now when I go in that bank, whoever the teller is, if it's a new one, you know, I'm talking, I'm doing those things. And I've told some of you before that when I get in an elevator, I purposefully try to start a conversation to work on that part. Up in front of a crowd, I was always never bothered to be animated, but I work on the one and one And she has helped me greatly in that. And so being submissive does not mean a woman is a lap dog. She is there to work together with her husband. Because sometimes us husbands, we like to sort of slack back and let the wives do the job that we are intended to lead in. Ephesians 5, uh, 33 say, so again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. You know, when I read that a while, a good while back, I was like, wow, that is so right. Because most of the time, I'm not saying all the time, I'm not going to put every woman in, in one category or every man in one category, but most of the time, a man wants to be respected. He wants to have respect. He loves to have respect. And so, wives, don't, don't disrespect your husbands, especially in front of people or anything. But you know what a wife, usually, I'm not saying all of them, you might go like, that's not me. Uh, but a lot of women, they want to know they're loved. They want to know they're loved. And so Paul wisely writes, men, you respect your wives. And why? Excuse me. Ladies, you respect your husbands. And women, you love, men, you love your wife. I'm going to get this up here. So, men, you love your wife. Pretty much what God has designed. So let's start showing our wives we love them more. And, not, and, and, and we don't want to wait when she respects me. I will show her I love her. No, no, no. Submissively, you will love her even if she doesn't show you respect. And that's tough, isn't it? You respect your husband even if he's not showing you enough yet that he loves you. Your working can make that happen. And you're praying for your spouse. You can't change your spouse. I'm a fixer. And that's tough for me. Sometimes like, shut up, Dave. Shut up, Dave. You're not supposed to fix this. Shut up, Dave. You're a fixer. Quit it. Let God do it. Let God do it. I remind myself of this all the time. Shut your mouth, Dave. Let God fix this. You can't. And so we do our part in our relationships. We do our part. And if we both submit this way, we'll be surprised at the results that it brings about. There's a certain nature that God has built within us men. There's a certain nature he's put within women. And that's why he has this design. James Dobson, a few years back, um, focused on the family. And he raised a point that is especially the father who has an effect on the spiritual values of his children. In terms of faith, religion, and values, fathers generally have a far greater effect on children than do mothers. And there's a survey that points that out that was done a few years back. If both dad and mom attend church regularly, 72% of their children remain faithful. If only dad, 55% remain faithful. If only mom, 15% remain faithful. If neither, only about 6% remain faithful. Parents, we have a job to do. You know, when we look at, at life, we can see the different effects that men and women have. Men, it is not the mother's job to instruct the children about Jesus because that's a woman thing. No, certainly mom is a part of it and should be because of her love for her children. But I'm going to tell you, we need to be submissive to God and we as men need to stand up in our family and be the godly leaders that God has called us to be and not be distracted by everything else in the world because the most important thing in your child's life is that they know Jesus Christ. If you want them to know Jesus Christ, you can let them see Jesus just oozing out of you. That that's the most important thing in your life. You know, it's sad that many times young boys think the church is for, for women and kids because they don't see men actively working. Even in our children's department down there, you can ask our children's minister, can I help? If even if I'm just down there, we have some guys who do that. You know, if I'm just there doing things, can I? And she'll be like, yes, we love having men down here because young boys go like, oh, yeah. You know, this, this is what it's like. This is what it's like. Fathers, there are times we need to submit by not pushing our children and driving them, but by leading them with compassion. 
Colossians 3.21, the Apostle Paul kind of reiterates this thing again. Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they'll become discouraged. And that's true. We need to encourage. We need to show our children the way. We, both dads and moms, need to work together and lead our children to Jesus. You know, there are times that we get busy with our lives, our careers, and our hobbies. I remember Johnny Herbst, a preacher friend that had been in Cumberland for years. And when I first came into youth ministry, we were at a preacher's meeting. And Johnny was talking to me. He was congratulating me. He said, Dave, let me warn you one thing. Don't let the church become your mistress. Wow, how true those words are. Are. I love ministry. I love what I'm doing. And I can say to my wife, but I'm doing God's work. And Satan laughs and says, but you're supposed to love your wife and make sure that you're taking care of your family too. You've got to be very, very careful. Things can take place. Talk to a lot of guys who play instruments and the wife will say, you love your guitar more than you love me. Now, I understand there are some women who have some issues, but a lot of times there's a lot of truth in that. Why would she say that? You care for that guitar more than you care for me. You clean that guitar. You change the strings on it. You play it every night, but you don't talk to me. So we just need to be very careful and alert, alert that we're not allowing other things of the world to creep in. And we're all about me instead of we and our family. And man, I'm telling you, this is tough. Because you might be living with a spouse right now who, who, who's not close to God. And you've been married to him. And, and you're thinking, God, this is tough. I feel lonely. I, I feel so lonely right now. And God's saying, hang in there, hang in there. And it is tough. Submissive to Christ, all of us. So it's tough. But as families, we need to take time to laugh together. Spend time together, laugh together. Laughter is a powerful medicine. I am so thankful that finally, throughout the last few years, we see Christian comedians. I love Christian comedians because their humor is clean. But laughter is a medicine. Laughter is a medicine. We need to laugh together. I just saw a, a, an article talking about laughter, how children laugh uh, you know, so much. But then as people get older, the laughter diminishes. But you know what laughter does? It, it releases these endorphins in us. And it, it helps us to be healthier. It helps us to enjoy life more. And so I enjoy laughing and laughter. Found this little catchy thing. The boy said to his teacher, my father's name is laughing and my mother's name is smiling. And the teacher said, you must be kidding. To which the boy replied, no, that's my brother. I'm joking. <laughs> we need to be able to have a sense of humor together. Because you know what happens? Life comes in. You see that person who's just like full of life and spunk. And sometimes this happens in marriages. You know, the guy meets this young lady. And this young lady is just full of life. She loves life. And, and the guy's just like, oh, I just love this. But then life comes in and stress happens. And stress happens. Bills happen. Children happen. So all of a sudden, where's the joy? Where's the laughter? And the guy, not being submissive to God, says, hey. That young lady over there seems like she's smiling and enjoying life. I think I'll have more fun with her. No, let's work together. Be submissive to God's plan. Let's take time to throw off the stress, get rid of some of the junk you're in, and focus on our families in a godly way, and then laugh together so that you can even be healthier, to tell you the truth. Uh, it'll help you in your health in all means. And so we need to be careful. You see, God designed the family. God designed the family, and that stinking, dirty Satan will attack the family bigger than anything else. I remember it was only about a year and a half, almost two years ago, when he attacked at my family. And I'm going to tell you, that was a tough time in my life. It was tough. I remember I found out on Saturday night, and I had to come out and preach on Sunday morning, the hardest sermon I'd ever preached, and not trying to show everybody that something was going on, and, 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 and Satan was sitting there eating up. And let me tell you, I don't know how much I've ever prayed so hard in my life until I got sick of praying and praying and praying until God broke through. And I'm so thankful for that because God, Satan, wants to destroy the family. And I just said, Satan, you stinking low life of a dog. You know that's the very thing that I've been speaking on. You know that's the very thing, the heart of this. And you, you come attacking. And that's what he does. That's what he'll do. You know, we are going to have to be brave enough to stick it out when things get tough. And we're going to have to be willing to put in the effort for our family. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. The whole story 
Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. Fear God and obey his commands, and for this is everyone's duty. So where do I get up and I do what I do every morning? I pick up my phone and I turn to the U version of the Bible, see what the verse of the day is. It was this scripture. I'm like, God, you, you're so amazing. Because that's that was this scripture here that, that he laid on my heart to use as a closing scripture today. You know, nothing else matters. And man, I gotta tell myself that. Dave, nothing else matters. Fear God obey his commands, and you better make sure your loved ones know Jesus. That are damn in the side by side with my grandkids. And, and I take opportunity riding around is beautiful. Doesn't God make this beautiful? God is so awesome. You know, we'll say little things. And, and if they bring up something that's kind of like to where they could get in trouble, you know, or they're being selfish or something, I can bring in little things. But but if you're riding along, I say, you know what Pops wants most of all for you all? And they're like, No. I said, Pops wants you to know Jesus. I want you to know Jesus and love Jesus, because that's the most important thing in your life. You see, I, I want to just like plant little seeds here, and I want to like preach in sermons. I'd be like, poor kids. He must stand up there and like break out the Bible and start preaching at him every time. No, it's just like life things. Life things. That's what I love to do, because I love them. And I want them, the most important most thing of all is they know Jesus. And I know some of y'all are here today within the hearing of my voice, whether in this building or whether listening online. And you're saying, well, you know, this sermon doesn't have to do anything with me. I don't really have any family around anymore. But that's so untrue. Because you can become part of someone's family. You can be family for someone. I remember Mrs. McCannon, whom Tammy and I helped take care of. And actually, I give the credit to Tammy, uh, taking care of her uh, more than anything. And she lived to be 102 years old. But there were many times that she would say, I want to thank you all for letting me be part of the family. And she was. The kids would call her Granny Marge. And she became part of the family. She's every Christmas, every meal. She got gifts. She was part of the family. Sometimes she might have missed you one when the grandkids, you know, would be up there. But especially one time when uh, Davy's boy was two. And I'm not sure if my other grandson was in there. And he'd been about the same age, just a little bit older. And Mrs. McCannon had one of those chairs that raised up to help you stand up. And we're all in the kitchen. We're helping, help, help, no, no, no. My little two-year-old grandson has a hold of the button. And he's raising that chair. <laughs> yeah, we run in there real quick and save her. But, you know, family... It's important in you, whether you have you know, blood relatives alive or not, you can be family to someone. You know, I think of a lady right now that enters my mind, and I just love her to pieces talking with her. And that's Anne McPeak, and she does have some family. But, you know, if you're thinking, well, I'd like to be family even to somebody that's older, that woman there just, she, she amazes me. If you ever know Anne, she's play working here. What a wonderful sense of humor. So I'm out here at the yard sale, and I'm standing there talking to somebody. I saw her come out of the corner of my eye. She always says this one thing to me when she sees me. How old, how old is Annie? 96? Yeah. She'll be Tuesday. This Tuesday, 96. Oh, thank you. i got to remember that. Okay. Yeah, 96. But that woman is a blast. And so I'm sitting there talking to somebody, and she gets up beside me, and she goes, shit. That's what she always tells me. But she brings joy. And I told her, she's like, oh, I'm glad I do something for somebody. I was like, you are joy. And she is. I'm thinking, if I get that old, I want to be like that. You know, Henri and everything else she is. There's a lot of stories I can tell you about Anne, I tell you. So, I mean, you can adopt them. But there was a couple, Jack and Wilma. And Jack and Wilma were an older, humble couple. Jack had this low voice, never got in a hurry for anybody. Christian couple, Wilma, she would speak very quietly. And she would teach the young children in church. They had four children. All four of them were, were athletes. And uh, they were, ever since I can remember them, they always were an older couple, but it's, you know, grown up. But anyway, uh, when the one, only one was left in the home, they began to take in foster children. This humble, humble couple began to take in foster children. And I'll tell you that I can remember at least three of them, and I can't remember how many more they had. But you know what happened when those foster children come into their home? They become followers of Jesus. That was, that was cool. It was amazing. So there was this one boy and this one young guy. I was a young man then. And he would hang around me a lot because I worked with the youth. And, and uh, then finally he went back to his home. But some years later, this has been quite a few years ago because Jack and Wilma have both gone on to be the Lord. And Wilma receives a phone call. And it's this foster child. And he, when he calls her, he says, Mom. And she said, Yeah, is everything okay? And he says, I'm sick. And she, they talk for a while. About a week goes on, she gets a call again. Mom, I'm sick. I've got AIDS. 
Mom, will Jesus still love me? Will he still care about me? And Wilma said, honey, if you turn to Jesus, he's there with his arms open. He'll give you forgiveness. This young man died of AIDS, but he died knowing that someone that was not his birth mother, but someone whom he called mom because she cared enough to share Jesus that he could call and say, Jesus still care about me, even though I've messed up in my life. Family, family is powerful. You never know who you are going to touch if you reach out and share family. But it takes submission. All of us are to submit. We're to submit to God's plan every day of our lives. The only place I know where you go, I surrender, and then God says, you're the winner. Isn't that amazing? I surrender, God. You are the winner. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ. I am telling you, you're missing the boat. I would tell you the road's not always easy. Matter of fact, Jesus said, hey, follow me is tough, all right? I'm not going to give you this little yucky, yucky story of how everything's wonderful when you follow Jesus. I mean, I love it. I would trade it for the world. And I absolutely mean for the world, for any riches, for anything. I would not trade knowing Jesus Christ in my life. So I'll tell you, it gets hard sometimes. But it's worth it. And maybe you're here and it, you're just going through some difficult stuff. We'll have prayer partners in the four corners of our building. And then afterwards, we've got a prayer room down the hall on the right. If you want to go ahead and pray with somebody, I'll be down here. But maybe you're to that point that you're saying, you know what? I trust Jesus Christ. I want to make that known to the world. And I want to be obedient to him in baptism. And, and today, we're ready. I mean, we're just, we're ready. Like the early church. Why do we do that? Because the early church did. So that's why we do it. But whatever your decision is, don't put it off. Don't put it off. But make sure that you're moving in your relationships from plain old me, and it's all about me, to we. And how can we work together? Because family is important. If you have no blood relatives... Jump in and be family to someone because everybody needs Jesus and everybody needs someone to help them to come to Jesus. The song we're going to sing is called Completely. I am completely surrendering. I am being submissive. And today, even those of us who have been followers of Jesus for years, maybe even so uh, more to us who have been followers for years. Today, God, I'm just looking at my life and I'm saying, I want to completely surrender. There's some junk that I got in my way. And every day, you know, we have to look at our lives and go, like, God, that junk's in my way. Ugh. I gotta get it out of here. I'm gonna get closer to you. If you have a decision to make, let's stand. I'm gonna pray. I am completely surrendering. Finally.